One of the most important application of diodes is in the design of rectifier circuits. A rectifier circuit is something which is used in, in many power supplies. It's an essential building block of DC power supplies, especially when they are taking their input from an AC source. So this figure is showing a block diagram of a power supply, which is fed from 120 volt RMS 60 Hertz AC line, and it delivers a DC voltage V output. There's many steps involved, and we'll look at these steps and see what is the what is the what is the signal going through to give uh, an output of maybe four volts to twenty volts DC to an electronic circuit, which is shown as a load here. Now we have to see when we talk about DC, or as we see in that uh, straight line, this output has to be as constant at, as possible in spite of all the variations that may be there on the uh, AC line voltage and the current that the load is drawing. So in this block, in this picture, the first block is the power transformer and it has two separate coils which are wound uh, around, around an iron core. The primary winding has N1 uh, turns and is connected to the AC power supply 120 volt here. The secondary winding has N2 turns, uh, different number of turns, and it's connected to the circuit of the DC power supply. So that's the input. Now there's a relationship on the turns that which helps us define what kind of uh, numbers of turns do we need to get the output that we need. But in any case, this is the first step, which gives us, which not only gives us the basic DC signal, but it also gives us isolation between the electric equipment and the and the main power line that's in the in the input. And on the output, as we see, there is some uh, ripple, if you can see, which is not ideal, but this is the ideal that so what do we do there so first type of rectifier that we'll look at is called half wave rectifier and as the circuit shows we can see that if there is an input coming like this the positive side of this signal will be when the that's when the diode will be conducting and once we get into, and that's this blue here, what we are seeing, the blue signal. But when we get into the negative bias, which is this guy, then it will not be conducting. So you're just getting the uh, zero current there, zero voltage there. So if we, if you write it down, we can say that the output is zero when the source voltage is less than the diode voltage and it's it's conducting and and the output is then the difference of the source and the diode voltage drop when the signal is greater than or equal to the diode voltage it's the the basic fundamental understanding of what would happen for a half-wave rectifier. And in interest in VD would be, again, that we know the diode voltage is 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, depending on whatever the spec sheet tells us about it. So when we select the diode for rectifier design, there are two important parameters that we need to know. One is the current handling capability of the diode, which is determined by the, the largest current that it can be expected to conduct. And we know on the forward bias that current is uh, linear in this model, but on the on the reverse bias, we know that there is, there is this breakdown uh, 
happens where we get a lot more current that can flow. So we need to know what is the largest current that the diode can conduct, especially the on the reverse bias. So we call it peak inverse voltage. And it's the voltage that the diodes the, must be able to withstand without breakdown. And this is the important factor that we will look for almost every application peak inverse voltage. So in this case, the peak inverse voltage is determined by the signal that we are applying and that signal will determine that what it should be for a particular uh, diode that we use. So normally we, we select a diode that has reverse breakdown voltage at least 50% greater than the expected peak inverse voltage that we would encounter. So in this case, that's the, the, the signal voltage that we are we should take as a frame of reference for the uh, peak inverse voltage that we can expect. So there are, we can use the diode exponential characteristic to get the exact transfer characteristics. And, and that's the, a little bit more involved, but we, we can, we are happy with this model for now. Because we'll see, because AC signal is changing, so there are other more important factors in the design that we should be interested. And another interesting thing that this this doesn't work for an, a signal which is uh, when the input signal is small. So, for example, we cannot rectify in, in a, a signal of hundred millivolt with this. For those cases, we have to use precision rectifiers. So that's another class of of rectifiers that we'll, we'll look at. Now, this, so this is half wave rectifier. So then of course there's full wave rectifier. What's happening here is the secondary winding is center tapped. So what we, in the transformer, we are taking the secondary winding and we are providing two equal voltages Vs across the two halves of the secondary winding with the polarities as sh they are shown here. So you have this guy plus and this is, so it's relative for signal. And for this guy, these are the polarities for the two circuits that are now made because we have tapped it into the, we have connected it into the, into the, uh, So the what's happening here is in when the input voltage is feeding the primary when it's positive both of the signals labeled Vs will be positive. In this case now when the, there's input signal is positive we have D1 conducting. When D1 conducts we get the current flowing and in that time D2 will be reverse biased. So we'll get signal only coming through D1. Now, when the input voltage goes in the negative half cycle, so both of the voltages Vs will be negative. So now D1 will be cut off while D2 will conduct. And in this case, we will still get the current through our resistance <clears throat> and, and back to the center tap. So in the negative high, half cycle while D2 conducts, the circuit is behaving again as a half wave rectifier like it was behaving for the D1. The, the important point is that the current through R is always flowing in the same direction. So output voltage is unipolar. And this output signal that's shown here, the blue here is the output, and we can see that this is even whatever the, uh, I'm just drawing it out of phase, but you, you see the blue trace is what is showing us the output that we'll get. <clears throat> and there is a diode has a voltage drop. So that's shown here as the difference of the signal Vd. 
and it's a constant voltage drop so this is the then the output wave from uh, the input which is going in both sides but the blue one is only result of two half wave rectifiers so it's more energetic waveform than the half wave but and, and we are always using some sort of full wave rectifier now here again the piv is important we need to know what is the peak inverse voltage so if you look at the the configuration this is now two vs are applied here and pi would be then the twice the signal and minus the diode voltage now v output is at at maximum is always the difference of vs and vd right so that's graphically we have shown that and the signal at peak is going to maintain vs but the output will always be after we take care of the drop across the diode so now this one is approximately twice than the case for the half wave rectifier now another way how we use them a full wave rectifier is this now this is called a bridge rectifier it's like this a circuit what we call wheatstone bridge and what you see is we don't need a center tapped uh, transformer in this case it's a simple configuration now the the the, the lack of the need of a centered tape tap transformer is a is it an advantage over what we saw before but we need more diodes here which is not a big deal because diodes there are so many diodes you get on one ic now what happens in this case so when there is positive half cycle on the input again vs when it is on the positive half cycle right during this part what we see is d1 conducts that's forward bias and the current goes through r and goes through d2 so that's the path for when the signal vs is on the positive side now what happens when the and, and here again there are two diodes so there are two diode voltage drops on the signal and that's if you compare it with the previous ones we had one voltage drop across one diode so a slight disadvantage but 0.7 volt and 0.7 volt now if we consider the situation of negative half cycle of the input let me uh, maybe use a different color so in this case now there are d3 and d4 conducting so what we would get is current going like this so what's interesting here is that during both half cycles the current is flowing through the resistance in the same direction from right to left and so we output is always going to be positive and that's what is shown here now you have to see something interesting here that the the signal is now difference from on the output is is by 2 vd because of two diodes are in the path so now when we look at the uh the peak inverse voltage of each diode we see that there's a loop formed and that makes it a little bit different for us to see how and what is the peak inverse voltage so if you look at the loop for example uh, 
D3, R and D2. We can see that the voltage drop in the reverse for D3 is the output plus the VD2 which is in forward bias. So let me just write F and R to depict. So we just did do an analysis across a loop and, and we see that when D3 is forward biased, D2 is, when D2 is forward biased, D3 is, is reverse biased. So that can give us what is the voltage drop across D3. So the maximum voltage of VD3 occurs at the peak of output voltage and this can be then given by the signal minus 2VD which is two diodes that are coming in the in the loop and the diode the third diode which is added to it because it's about half the voltage for full wave rectifier. So if I simplify this, this is Vs minus Vd. So which means that this is an advantage for the bridge rectifier because it's PIV is half the value for the full wave rectifier that we have with the center tap transformer. So another advantage is that when you use the a center tape transformer, we are only using about half as many turns in this case from the secondary winding. So this is just showing that when it's forward bias, there is uh, which one is conducting and which one is open circuit. Now the output what we see here is, again, there is, it's not, ideally what we would want from a DC power supply as we, we said at the start, it's supposed to be without ripples. But what we are seeing here is we see lots of ripples like we can see here in this situation. And that's, not, that's still far away from this. So what do we do? So one trick is to use an RC circuit, so use a capacitor. So fundamentally the capacitor would be charging when there is a low time and it would start discharging as soon as the, the output goes, as soon as the input goes or changes phase and goes to the negative side. So this is what we call a peak rectifier or a rectifier with the field capacitor with the filter capacitor so the pulsating output voltage is not good for our dc application so we use a capacitor across load resistance what it does is it reduced reduces the variation in the rectifier output voltage by a big uh, difference. And now, if you think when DC is forward biased, C is getting charged. When it is forward biased, this is getting charged because now there is a voltage across it, which is the same output voltage. And V output is equal to V input. We are just ignoring the, the diode drop right now, just to uh, see what happens. So this keeps on building up until the input voltage reaches its peak maximum, after which it will start going down and start decreasing. So as input voltage decreases, diode becomes reverse bias. So now output remains constant at VP, which is here, the power on the output. The capacitor retains its charge and ideally it would 
retain the charge and voltage indefinitely. Now when the R is at the output across C, which is the case here. So this is where ideally the capacitor should pick up and start discharging and, and we should maintain that voltage indefinitely, right? But now when we have a, a circuit, a resistance, a load resistance, there will be current flowing and of course there'll be discharge happening from the capacitor. So that's the interesting case. Now when D cuts off, the capacitor starts discharging through the load resistance. And it keeps on discharging until the input voltage exceeds the capacitor, uh, the capacitor voltage. And at that time, the, the diode becomes forward biased. So we, we would start from here and we would be, out would be going up and then capacitor picks up, capacitor keeps on discharging and then positive uh, VI become positive, D becomes forward bias. So it starts, it takes up the load and capacitor starts charging again and the cycle keeps on going. Now there are a few things that have to go into that design we have to have the value of capacitor so that the time constant CR has to be much greater than the discharge interval. So it has to be more than this. So which means that capacitor should not get fully discharged and its T is or CR is much larger than the signal the output signal that we expect. So now looking at uh, this this picture, we can see that uh, CR greater than T assumption can lead us to a few things. So one is straightforward. We start with the load current is equal to the output divided by R. And now the diode current is, is the, which is getting now divided through to capacitor current and the load current, right? So, and we can plug in the value for capacitor current. For a capacitor current is the C and DVI over DT. So we plug it here into this, we get capacitance time the voltage on the capacitor with respect to time plus the current that's used up by the load. Now what are few things happening here? The diode conducts for a brief time delta T when the peak of the input sinusoid in, uh, is results into the charging, it brings up the capacitor back to the charge that it has lost during the discharge interval. And this is equal to capital T that we have defined here. Now for an ideal diode, the conduction starts right away as soon as it becomes forward bias. So we call that as T1 here. So if I zoom in this picture, this starts happening at this time T1. And it stops at T2 shortly after the peak of the input voltage when it becomes reverse biased. So that's the same time when we get ID to be zero and capacitor picks up the current. Now this diode off in the interval, the capacitor discharges through R and V output then decays exponentially with the time constant CR. And that time interval is now so we pick the right capacitance so it's larger than the uh, 
the signal interval, the signal has to come back up before the capacitor discharges completely. Now, at the end of the discharge interval for for the entire period T, we have V output, which is equal to this voltage, maximum voltage, minus the ripple voltage, which is the difference between this, this difference. So, difference between the ripple, whatever is the distance between two, that has to be subtracted from the power that we need at the output. So, these results take us to find our output and we can find out exactly what is the ripple voltage because that will then tell us that what should be the the conduction interval for the for the signal and that's where then we can find out exactly for the design of a of a circuit like this what should be the the interesting parameters that we have to know so let's look at those parameters we start with of course we have found the current time interval t ripple voltage so the the load current is vp over r the current that we are getting in the at the output or more accurately we can write it as because we are only dealing with one half cycle we can write down v output equals vp minus half of vr so we have taken the average here for the ripple so we can see the diode off interval we can find out the the voltage at the output is a function of the capacitor discharge rate and that can be found by this exponential minus t over cr so when the discharge interval ends we have output which is the difference of output minus the ripple we write it vp minus vr and if you approximate this we get it to be almost equal to the to the current that we see with dependence on the cr the time constant for the circuit minus t over c r so this is an approximation to find the difference of these two the average of this guy but because it's an exponential decay so there is an exponential dependence now in this relation c r as we said before has to be much much greater than t so we can simplify this, we can get an expanded form of this and that gives us this part to be equal to 1 minus T over CR. So when I, if I plug in this into that relationship, what we get is the ripple is almost equal to the output times T over CR. So to now if you look at this relationship, we would see that to keep the ripple small, we must select a capacitance which gives us which satisfy this condition. So it's much larger. This guy is much larger, so this one is is the slowest, as small as, as possible. Alright, so that would would be directly something which we can use to find the ripple voltage now what is the frequency that we encounter so 
we can take the relationship f is equal to 1 over t which is frequency is reciprocal to time interval and so we can rewrite the right side where we would then have vp over f c r so using that relationship for vp we can write it in terms of the load current as well so that would become i l over f c so this is another way of looking at the approximation that the capacitor discharge is happening because of the load current and this is this thing is valid given the vr is much much smaller than vp now what is the conduction interval for this system we assume we call it delta t which is shown here t1 and t2 something we were discussing just now so what is the how do we find the time that the our diode conducts and the time that it stops conducting so if you assume there is no diode current we can write down a sine wave for and and no diode current at the peak of the output of course that's when it goes into into reverse bias so at that it's a sine wave out of phase we write cause omega delta t and this is equal to the difference of vp and vr now if i take omega which is 2 pi f angular frequency from the frequency and this is 2 pi by t as we know it's uh, inverse of the time so omega our angular frequency of the input voltage can be written like this now this tells us that omega is very small because this is much bigger than cr so what it means is we can simplify this cause and we can write we can expand cause to first two terms and we can write cause omega delta t to be equal to one minus half omega delta t squared so you plug in to that what we get is from these two we can write down our frequency to be equal to square root of 2 vp over v sorry v r over vp so this is the conduction interval for our circuit now when vr is much smaller vp the conduction angle will be small so this would be very small like we see here and this is based on our assumptions as well now what is the diode current during the time it conducts so let's call it id average and that's something we can uh, we start with the charge how much charge is stored because that's the current coming from diode and that charge is q supplied for s is we take i average current is i times the time for it this charge is being supplied to the capacitor and we know we id is split into ic and il load current and the current that's used up by capacitor so now if i 
if I change these to the average values and we can and we want to find the, the capacitor current, we can write IC average equal ID average minus the load current. So now what is the charge that is lost to the capacitor that can be written as QL, L for lost. And this is the capacitor times the ripple voltage. The time during which this is conducting and this is happening for the time for the VR voltage, the ripple voltage. And we know VR value we had, which is VP over FCR. And we know omega time uh, delta T we just looked at that. So if you plug in the values, we can we get a nice relationship for the current, diode current, average diode current, which is I L times one plus pi two V P over V R. So this gives us the current that is used up by capacitor for the charging. Now, what is the maximum diode current, which can be found from the relationship that we had for the capacitor, the, the current from the diode, which is used up by capacitor and by the load that we saw before. And, and that's, let me write down here, ID equals capacitor times the input voltage, change in the input voltage plus IL. So that would give us the, the maximum current, the, the peak value of the diode current that's being used up at the onset of the which starts from the onset of the conduction and goes all the way to the time delta t. So in this case then the ID max becomes, so we had ID average here and then ID max becomes, we have instead of just pi, then we have two pi here, one plus two pi and remaining relationship is the same. So we see that when the ripple is much, much smaller than the, the output, the power that's being supplied to the external circuit, in this relationship, we see that the ID becomes almost equal to ID max, almost becomes equal to two times ID average. So this is something which is for this peak rectifier, full wave peak rectifier, where we are using a signal which changes and a capacitor charges it during the time and gives us a signal, almost continuous signal with very small change in the output voltage. So there is ripple and that ripple is something that is important for us to know that what is the value and how does it change over time. So in the half wave case, the output DC voltage is almost equal to the peak value of the input sine wave. That's what we are seeing here. And the ripple frequency is twice that of, uh, uh, if you look at it, we can see that going from here to here, this is almost happening twice. So it, this frequency is, 
almost twice that of the input and we can find the peak to peak ripple voltage for this case uh, in the same way like we have done before so in this case vr would be vp over 2 fcr and we can plug in this value vr in the relationships that we saw before and we can modify them as well and express them in terms of the ripple voltage all right so where do we use this so it's a, a, a very simple application of uh, the peak rectifier circuits is in signal processing systems so this is a, a signal which is coming from a circuit that's called a peak detector so what we are seeing is we are detecting peaks so all those peaks are then giving us a signal which it has enveloped all these changes in the underlying signal. So it's enveloping. So this is a demodulator for amplitude modulated signals. So these are signals which are used for uh, communication, especially when we have, uh, when using low bandwidth signals. And in many cases, these synode side has time varying amplitude and this overall VP which varying over time that gives us the information that's being communicated, for example, the audio signal in, uh, in our AM frequencies. 